Hi, my name is Matthew Paul and this morning I'm going to be talking about the importance of sugars, particularly sugar signal known as trihalose 6 phosphate in improving crop yields, crop yield potential and drought stress tolerance. And we're using this knowledge through genetic modification and chemical intervention in cereals to improve crop yields. What I'm going to be telling you about then is research that we've been performing on sugars in, in plants and crops. And we've been adopting three different approaches to modifying particularly important sugar called trihalose 6-phosphate that performs a signaling function in plants. So it has a very powerful effect. And we've been using genetic methods as well as chemistry methods to modify amounts of this sugar phosphate in crops. And I want to say to you, as, as young people in science, you know, plant science is often the poor relation to other sciences, but I think there's never been a greater need for pl plant scientists to engage with agriculture because food security is becoming an important global issue. The only way we can really solve food security is by bringing plant science ideas, technology into agriculture. And wouldn't it be absolutely fantastic if we could find a cure. We often think about a cure for cancer, but wouldn't it be fantastic if we could find a cure for food insecurity, which still occurs around the world and could again become uh, a problem in the West. We've kind of taken it for granted that we get food in the shops, there's always going to be food there, but uh, it wouldn't take much for there to be food shortages. So we do need to think about new ideas, and one of the new ideas that we had was to use chemistry to modify trihalose 6 phosphate be telling you about that as well as the genetic methods. So there is a big need to improve yields as I've just said. We do need to actually move beyond the yield increases that are currently being achieved through conventional breeding. It's not sufficient to avert potential food shortages so we need step changes and that's where technology can come in. And so the, the sugar pathway that I'll be telling you about actually is about altering the way sugars flow in the plant. So we need to ensure that as much sugar from photosynthesis ends up as yield. It doesn't sit in the rest of the plant, but it ends up as yield. And that's easier said than done because the regulation of sugar metabolism and photosynthesis is very strong in plants. It's a bit like the blood sugar. Our blood sugar levels are controlled very strongly. It's very difficult to perturb blood sugar levels in healthy humans. And similarly in plants, if you try and increase photosynthesis, the plant often down-regulates it or will find a way to kind of dampen manipulations that we may make. So we need to be quite clever and think about the endogenous regulation of plant processes. So as I mentioned, we are, these are the kind of the global worst case scenarios and we were just talking at breakfast actually about wouldn't it be nice to have a, a week or two where there isn't some kind of disaster story in the news. Well, um, we do have political instability at the moment, unfortunately. We're leaving the EU. You know, we have Donald Trump as President of the United States. There are these ter terrorist attacks happening. And the last thing we need at the moment is something like crop failures to compound these kind of insecurities. And of course, crop failure and famine has been part of human history. Agriculture has been a great technological achievement, but when it goes wrong, it can ca cause serious problems. And in the 13th century, there was a period of large-scale famine, which followed a period of prosperity. So this probably took people by surprise. They'd taken their period of prosperity maybe for granted. There was a series of crop failures, and this had big effects, number of deaths. And of course, more, th more recently in Ireland, there was the potato famine in the 19th century and that, just before the potato famine the population of Ireland was half that of England. So around about 9 million people and present day population of Ireland still hasn't caught up with where it was in the 19th century whereas the population of England now is 55 million. So crop failure can have potentially big consequences, disastrous, disastrous effects and of course it's a constant un ongoing battle in certain parts of the world and particularly in Africa. And so <coughs> in the second half of the 20th, 
20th century, after the Second World War, there was a period of you know, food rationing ended in the 1950s. We had the Green Revolution, which I'll mention again in a moment, which saw crop yields increase, which meant that global food, su uh, su food supplies increased. And this, this graph shows you the uh, state of the, the world's grain supplies. And so at the end of the 20th century, there was a good supply of grain. So I think it says it's over 100 days, isn't it? But this has started to come down and we're now at the stage where we only have a 75-day supply of grain. And of course this is coincident with the financial crisis in 2008 as well. And there are some projections, of course, you get these perhaps exaggerated headlines, but nevertheless we need to pay attention to these. And as I've said, there's no greater now need for plant scientists to enter into solving some of these problems. And Part of the reason why there was a, a drop in food reserves was a, seri a series of bad harvests, 2008 and 2010. This caused, in about 2008, you may not remember, but there was um, a price, price of food increased in the shops. And the this really kind of raised the attention of the government and they started to think a bit more seriously about food security. And again, in, in 2010, there were similar things happening. As soon as it starts to affect food prices, then you know government starts to get concerned about it. And so why we need these increases in yields is that population continues to grow. So it's projected to continue growing through the 21st century. And there isn't any more land that we can cultivate. So there's always a demand on land for other and we don't want to be cutting down rainforests and so on, or native vegetation. And as the world develops, in China particularly, there's an increasing demand for meat consumption. And of course, that's an inefficient way of using crops. And then there's this ongoing climate change. <coughs> so what we need to do then is we need to be raising the yield ceiling on crops and combining that with protecting that yield ceiling against particularly droughts, but also other stresses, particularly drought. Drought is the most widespread abiotic stress that can limit crops worldwide. And so there is a need to actually double yields by 2050. And it's estimated that this requires a 2.4% yield increase per year. And this is above what we're currently achieving. So I've put here the four major food security crops, cereals particularly are food security crops, and these percentages are the current rate of yield increase that we're achieving for these, these crops. Wheat is, is particularly poor at the moment. And this just pre pre prevents, presents that information in a slightly different way. So the solid lines are the rate at which we're currently increasing these crop yields, and the dotted line is the rate at which we need to be increasing crop yields to avoid food insecurity. <coughs> so how are, we, how are we going to do this? Because current breeding is incremental. Obviously, it's achieved an awful lot, but it's quite slow. How can we speed it up? Genetic modification has achieved an awful lot for things like herbicide resistance and insect pest resistance. So, and farmers love growing GM crops in the countries where they're allowed to grow them. It's increased farmer profitability. It's reduced inputs of chemicals for insect pest resistant crops. And the profitability and yields have increased as a consequence of those traits. But there are very few traits that have been, uh, yield traits that have been improved by genetic modification. It's interesting to speculate why that is, although I've We'll be presenting an example where genetic modification of just one gene has improved yield. But it could be that because yield is such a complex trait, you're not going to be able to do it just by modifying one gene. You need to be able to modify one gene that then regulates lots of genes in order to, to modify yield. And often we don't know which genes to actually target for yield. So we need, we need this fundamental science understanding 
to understand much more about how plants work and what actually limits yield in the agricultural environment. And then new technology is coming on with regard to genome editing. This could be a new op opportunity for us. It's a non-GM approach. And as I've said, we don't know what the dual genes are. <coughs> and then we need to be thinking about other possible methods of yield improvement apart from genetics. And uh, so is it, do we need to really completely synthetically, you know, synthetic biology reorganisation of a crop or do we actually just need to be kind of tweaking a few genes for regulatory processes that are important? Is it a fine tuning of what's already going on or do we need to really completely rethink? I actually think it's a fine tuning of what's going on already. We just need better understanding of what actually limits yield in, in the agricultural environment. So I want to talk to you about <coughs> previous improvements in crop yields. The Green Revolution of the 1960s and 70s. Norman Borlaug was behind this. He was someone actually who failed one of his first entrance exams, but he kept going and um, <coughs> We were talking about success and failure yesterday evening and, and Winston Churchill once said that um, success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. And certainly in science, if you want to be successful, you've got to keep going. You've got to be resilient and keep going. Be persistent. And, you know, you shouldn't dismiss failure because you learn, can learn an awful lot from it. And it's about turning failure into success that really makes a big difference. And s this, a normal ball alg, was somebody who, who just kept going, worked very hard, was committed to the cause and saved, it's estimated, a billion lives as a consequence. And this, this graph is taken from Rotham Sid, where I, the institute where I work. We have the longest running field experiments in the world going back to 1843, where wheat has been grown continuously year on year since 1843 given different treatments and you can see at the bottom this is wheat grown without any fertiliser and you get about one tonne per hectare which is actually what uh, the, the yields that uh, are currently achieved in many parts of the developing world at the moment. Fertiliser obviously gives, uh, gives a, a yield improvement but this increase here was a consequence of the Green Revolution, Norman Borlaug introducing short stemmed wheat and also disease resistant wheat. So this, this has been tremendously important. So in addition to things like rotations and use of, of different chemicals. And we're now up to about 10 tonnes per hectare in, in a good year. So that's tenfold higher than without any, any human intervention down here. The thing to note though about this graph is that we've got this levelling off. As I mentioned, wheat yields are not increasing now at the rate that they need to be <coughs> to avoid food shortages. And so what Norman Borlag was able to do was to select wheat varieties that had shorter straw. So in the natural environment, plants will want to grow tall to outgrow their neighbours. So it's, it's a strategy to, for survival, but it's at some cost to seed yield. So the plants with taller stems will be compromised in their seed, seed yield, but at least they will have outcompeted their neighbour and survived. Whereas these ones down here will be partitioning much more biomass into the grain. And this shows you it's not just that people were shorter in the Middle Ages, the wheat actually was a lot taller than it is now. And this is um, a picture taken at Rothamsted in the 19th century showing again how, how tall the wheat used to be. So it's quite a simple trait actually, simply reducing stem height and Borlaug didn't know the mechanism behind this, but we, we now know that it's interfering with gibberellin signalling. So this controls uh, stem elongation. And another trait that Borlaug was able to modify was uh, uh, resistance to rusties, rusts. So rust can uh, have a big impact on, on crop yields, and he was able to introduce some of these genes to present, prevent uh, yield losses that way as well. So in terms of uh, increasing stress resilience as well as your potential, we need to be thinking about drought. 
which as I've uh, said is the most widespread stress even in the UK and this I've put this slide in to show you that actually the most productive years are, are the fat ones the fat rings here represent the wet summers so and and this season hasn't been particularly kind of um, dry but we did have a very dry April and we may not think of that as a drought but it that m there may have been an impact on on wheat yields we'll have to wait and see but uh, you know, even kind of a subtle drought, we're not, we're not thinking of devastating droughts like we had back in the 1976, but even um, small amounts of drought like that can actually have an impact on crop yields that we had back in April. So we went, went for the whole month practically without any rainfall. And uh, <coughs> other parts of the world suffer drought more than we do. So the United States had a particularly bad drought in 2012 which affected their maize crop. So what we need to be doing then is combining raising the yield, ra raising the ceiling on yield potential and combining this with resi uh, stress resistance. So is, is it possible to do this? Another problem is that, as I've said, conventional breeding is incremental. We need to be speeding it up if we can. GM does not have wide acceptance. And as I'll give you an example where targeting one pathway with one gene is, is giving an increase in yield. And then we need to be thinking about alternative strategies. And we need continuing research into fundamental science so that we know actually how plants work and what limits yield in, in the agricultural environment. So we need to be combining high yield potential and protecting this potential from these stresses. Well, if you think about it, plants that grow in, in dry environments are quite different to those that grow in productive environments. And so it's difficult to take all of the traits from this environment and put them into wheat to combine resilience to drought with productivity. We want wheat to be productive. We want it to be resilient, but we also want it to be productive. It's no good if we have wheat pr plants that survive drought, but don't yield very much, if they just sit there and survive. There may be some mechanisms that we can think of that we can take from desert plants, perhaps some of their you know, heat stress mechanisms that protect cells from extreme heat above 35 degrees. But by and large, we need to be thinking a bit more creatively about rather than simply going, taking genes from this environment into this environment. And what, what we've been thinking about and focusing on <coughs> for, for nearly 20 years now is what is termed source and sink processes and sugar metabolism and how uh, source is linked to sink through sugar metabolism. So sucrose is produced in photosynthesis. We need to ensure that as much of that sucrose as possible ends up in, in the yield part of the plant. And by doing this, by ensuring that as much sucrose ends up here, we can actually increase yield potential and we can also protect that yield from drought, we found. So we can kill two birds with one stone by targeting one process. And as I've mentioned, the regulation of photosynthesis is, is quite complicated. It's a whole plant process. You can't look at photosynthesis in isolation from the rest of the plant. Because we know that what goes on in the sink actually regulates the source. And we know from the results that we're getting that this process, this integration of source and sink is not yet optimised for yield and resilience in crops. <coughs> and it's actually a way to improve photosynthetic efficiency as well. So we can actually increase photosynthetic rate by improving sink strength. So photosynthesis is an extremely important process driving the planet. It's estimated that about 30 tonnes of starch and cell wall carbohydrates are produced per person per year. So that's an amazing amount of biomass. So if we go outside and look around we can see structures like the trees. Cellulose is lots of glucoses linked together. 
in a slightly different configuration to starch. So these alpha and beta configurations, glucose is linked together, can form these tremendous structures that make up the vegetative environment. And sucrose is particularly important because it's the end point of photosynthesis, but it's a starting point for growth and yield determining processes. So it forms its breakdown, then forms the starting point for starch synthesis and cell wall synthesis. And the carbon skeletons for protein, oils, of course, provides ATP, and carbon skeletons for secondary metabolites. And so we really need to understand what regulates the use of sucrose. There has been attention in the past on glucose as a signaling molecule, but glucose is not produced directly in photosynthesis, it's a breakdown product. And it, it doesn't tell you, it, sucrose is ideally placed because it, it, it gives you information about the rate of photosynthesis and it also then is a starting point for end product synthesis and growth and development and all these important processes. And you can say that all the variation that we see is determined by how plants use their sucrose. So it's really important that we understand the regulation of sucrose use. And so we're, we're focusing on the regulation of sucrose use that we're finding regulates both its utilisation and allocation in the plant. And so far, modification of this pathway in three major crops, three cereals, is improving yield, including yield potential and drought resilience and by three different strategies. And so the sugar cycling pathway that regulates sucrose use is the trailers pathway, which is very similar actually to the sucrose pathway. Although you'll notice that the distribution of genes along the pathway is quite different to sucrose. We have 11 TPS genes, 10 TPP genes, and only one trahalase gene, whereas we have all these genes involved invitases and sucrose synthases involved in the breakdown of sucrose and that tells you something that actually tra the regulation of trailer 6-phosphate control of its levels is particularly important. Now going back 20 years or so it was thought that trahalose was only important in some marginal resurrection species in accumulating to higher levels to enable them to survive almost complete desiccation and then enabling them to almost completely resurrect or completely resurrect uh, when resupplied water. So it was thought that it was marginal interest, curiosity interest really. And here I'm just showing the major uh, circulatory sugars, obviously glucose in mammals, sucrose in plants. Trehalose accumulates in high levels in a number of organisms. The only organisms that can't make trehalose are vertebrates and uh, resurrection plants do accumulate trehalose to high levels but in the vast majority of plants trehalose accumulates in much lower levels so it's a low flux pathway in, compared in comparison to sucrose and trehalose 6-phosphate is the key regulatory metabolite and what T6P does is it, it tracks sucrose so sucrose induces trailer 6-phosphate and it's at much lower levels, at least a thousand-fold lower. We don't know the exact uh, molecular details of how it induces it, but it involves TPS genes and TPP genes. But we do find that there is this very good interrelationship between sucrose levels and, and T6P levels in different plants and crops in Arabidopsis. And in wheat and maize, you get this very good interrelationship So, and what T6P does is it actually then regulates the gene expression for transport of sucrose and for the utilisation of sucrose in end products. So it regulates the gene expression for all these different processes. And we found, we discovered this at Rothamsted, that it does it by inhibiting a protein kinase. Called, which is called SNRK1. Now, protein kinase is involved in phosphorylation 
cascades are particularly important in communication in plants and animals they're involved in, in regulation of cancer and SNRT1 is a is a stress protein kinase that actually uh, protects cells from a carbon and energy deficit so it senses uh, starvation conditions it's activated by AMP and it's inhibited by trahalo 6-phosphate that we found so T6P switches off this stress function and activates the biosynthetic pathway function. So it's telling the plant there's lots of sucrose available, you need to grow now and develop and make end products. And what you find is when you look at gene expression in response to T6P, you get uh, the green light for uh, biosynthetic processes, growth and development, things like starch synthesis. Whereas uh, survival genes are then switched off. So genes involved in, in stress and surviving, conserving ATP, conserving carbon, <coughs> are switched off by this. So when there and so you have feast and famine conditions. When sucrose is available, you have high T6P, inhibition of the protein kinase. When sucrose is in short supply, there's much less T6P, the protein kinase is active. And you find that genes for the mobilisation of reserves, such as starch, are activated. Sucrose transport is activated as well. And so there are different processes that we can modify by targeting trahalo 6-phosphate. So we found that we can actually alter the movement of sucrose to the grain by targeting T6P. Once the sucrose then gets the grain, then we can improve the conversion into starch by targeting T6P. We found that recovery from stress can be influenced by targeting T6P. And another lab, which I'll present briefly, has shown that uh, T6P can actually enable anaerobic germination for, rice, uh, for the rice crop that's sown under flooded conditions, and this is quite important. So there were the three examples of in... <coughs> nature journals that have been published in the past two or three years that are showing yield improvements by targeting T6P in different ways through GM, through a natural variant and through a chemical approach. And so I'll mention briefly <coughs> work that showed that a trailer's phosphate phosphatase underpinned genetic variation for germination of rice under flooded conditions. Now this is quite important because currently, or before this discovery, rice was transplanted in flooded fields. So this, this is quite, this is drudgery of, of, of having to do this. So there's a big labour saving of being able to sow rice directly. And also the having to transplant rice plants uh, hits the yield as well. So there's some yield check as a, as a consequence of transplanting rice. So the rice plants are high yielding. And what this trailer's phosphate phosphatase was doing was decreasing trailer 6-phosphate levels, which were sending out a stronger starvation signal during germination, enabling much better mobilisation of starch, which then um, meant that the, the, rice, the rice plants germinated better under flooded conditions. So now I'll present two examples from our lab where we've modified T6P through GM and through a chemical method and we've been able to increase both grain numbers and grain size with this approach. So I've, I've talked, I've said how important drought is, so, but it's particularly important during the flowering period. So what can happen during this period is that if plants are short of water during the flowering period, they, they will abort their grain. And this is a survival strategy to ensure that at least some grain survive. The plant has got no way of knowing if the drought is going to be short or long term, so it adopts a safety strategy first, which often means that it aborts more seed than it needed to have done. So a GM strategy targeting T6P to prevent this from happening during drought has been successful. And I'm going to tell you about that. So this is a GM approach, targeting again the trailer's phosphate phosphatase with a particular promoter 
that's active during reproductive development. In, uh, this is a cross-section of a maize cob, and the, the blue staining shows you where the gene is expressed, the transgene is expressed. So the transgene is expressed in the vascular tissue, in the phloem we found. <coughs> so it's pulling down T6P in the phloem, sending out the starvation signal, and what this appears to do is to then draw more sucrose into the developing female reproductive tissue, preventing this grain abortion during drought at flowering. And so we did this work in collaboration with Syngenta over a number of years, going back more than 10 years. And the, these crops have been uh, field tested. So it's really important that uh, a promising trait like this is field tested because often there are, you can get very interesting or exciting results in the lab that when you transfer them to the field, they, they don't work. And that's because the field environment is so different to the lab environment. There's so much variability and things you can't factor in in, in, in a, a glass house or in a, in a growth chamber. So much variability, variability from season to season. And to really thoroughly test a trait that is high yielding, you need to do field testing. And the best way to do that is, is with a company like Syngenta who've got these facilities to do it in different parts of the world. They did field testing in North and South America. They can, you can replicate plots in different ways, so you can do it completely randomised, or you can, um, you can grow your control plants next to your transgenics, so that, because the field can, be, can vary from one end to the other in terms of the slope and maybe water availability and so on. It's often better to grow your control plant next to your, directly next to your transgenic to factor for that. And so they field tested these transgenics, expressing this transgene driven by the MAD6 promoter that was expressed during the flowering period. And they found a consistent improvement in yield. So this, this is a summary graph showing the percentage yield improvement of the transgenic against non-transgenic, so plants that have not been improved in this way. And what we've got pl plotted across the bottom is the yield, so up to 10 tonnes per hectare and at di different levels of drought. So as the yield drops, the drought is getting worse and worse, and the percentage benefit gets much, much stronger as the drought gets worse. So even without drought, right up here, there, there is a 10% yield benefit. And so that these are field trials done in California, Colorado, Chile, different parts of the United States, and there was a consistent yield benefit of at least 10% without drought and then a, a stronger percentage increase with drought. So it's been impossible then to improve both yield potential and drought resilience by transforming a TPP gene with this particular promoter. Although I should say that Syngenta have tested maybe a hundred different promoter gene constructs and this was the only one that produced this yield benefit. So with a, such a powerful sugar signal like this, it's important to target it carefully with the right promoter in the right cells. It appears that getting it in, in the uh, vasculature, pulling down T6P, has produced this positive effect. And so what we've been looking at as well is to try and work out exactly how this has been achieved. In, we, kn we know that T6P has been pulled down in the vasculature. So we've been doing dissections of the reproductive tissue to look at gene expression and uh, metabolite profiles in the different tissues that make up the reproductive yeah. tissue. And we found that the biggest changes in gene expression, I won't go into all, all the different changes that we found, uh, were found in, in the pith tissue and also in, in the florets. And this makes, them, this makes them set more grain and it's made them high yielding under, with and without drought. So, just presenting it in a different way, we're shifting by expressing this transgene in the vasculature, pulling down T6P, we're shifting sh uh, sugars, sucrose, and amino acids from the pith into the developing kernels. So this is one of few examples where GM of plant metabolism or, or of yield has actually improved yield in field conditions. And after extensive field tests, many examples that work in the lab but often fail when they're, when they're tried, or simply they haven't been tested in the field, and that needs to, to happen. So um, <coughs> you can see actually that this represents a lot of work. You have to do lots of field trialling, you have to develop these different promoter gene constructs. 
and you need to be collaborating really with a big company to be able to do this properly. So I also had the thought some years ago, well, why don't we just try and spray T6P on? Why go to all this bother? And why not just do it chemically? Now, I've talked to you in the, in the, the rice that can germinate under flooded conditions and in the transgenic maize that I've talked to you about, it's about decreasing T6P to enhance sucrose transport as a survival mechanism. But there may be benefits too of increasing T6P. So, for example, to actually increase bi starch biosynthesis. And having something that you could just spray onto a crop would be possibly a, a way to do that. So we um, were fortunate enough to collaborate with Ben Davis, a chemist at Oxford University. The problem with T6P is you can't just spray it on in its natural form because it's not taken up. It doesn't cross plant membranes. So Ben Davis devised a strategy, a chemical strategy, to attach groups to enable the uptake of this sugar. So you can then spray it on and then he also devised a strategy where these groups are then UV cleavable, so they're cleaved away in UV light. So you can actually spray the compound on, it's taken up, and then the T6P is released in UV light. And we, we've tried out several compounds, but the ones we've focused on that seem to be more successful are these two. They have slightly different uptake rates, slightly different release rates, but they both seem to be very effective in improving T6P contents. And what we find is then you can apply this, either you do it outside in sunlight or you can uh, do it under a UV lamp. <coughs> we do it, did a lot of the initial testing in Arabidopsis grown in, in culture systems like this. And you can get this really big increase in T6P, much bigger than you would get with a genetic modification. So, and the plant can't do much about it, whereas with a genetic modification, the plant's got all these endogenous regulatory mechanisms that can often dampen the, the genetic modification. But with a chemical effect, with a chemical treatment, you can just hit them with this, and we're getting up to even, even more than a hundredfold change. Now, this may seem perhaps unphysiological or a bit extreme, but maybe we've really got to shift physiological boundaries actually to get big changes in crop yields. And we can do it with T6P chemicals. <coughs> and th this graph just shows the tracking of the radio label T6P. So you get this big pulse of T6P within an hour or so, and then it comes back down as the plant metabolizes it with its, with its endogenous enzymes. So T6P is released, it's metabolized, met metabolized to trehalose and then to glucose. And we've tried this out in Arabidopsis culture systems. And we wanted to see if this could be a way of increasing starch content. So we did it first in Arabidopsis, and we found that there was an increase in starch content. We could explain it through one of the key enzymes of starch synthesis, AGPase, and both the rate of starch synthesis and the accumulation was increased. Obviously, then we need to then needed to transfer it to crops. And uh, Cara Griffiths did these experiments. She's in the audience, one of the tutors. And so we found in wheat that spraying during the grain filling period when starch synthesis is starting to occur, that you get this big increase in T6P and harvesting the grain a month later gives you up to a 20% yield increase in terms of grain yield per plant and the grains have more starch in their grains. So this was um, a really pleasing result and we also noticed that if you just target the chemical to the ear, that a day or so later, that the rate of photosynthesis in the flag leaf is higher than in the control plant. And this carries on actually for quite a while as well. So again, the, the, the sink is affecting the source. And we also wanted to ask the question, for the yield effect that we saw, this 20% yield increase, what kind of, so we're just getting this effect by spraying ears increasing their starch content, what kind of rate of increase in photosynthesis would be required to give that kind of yield increase simply by increasing the amount of light? And we found that by, so they're grown at 500 micromoles per meter squared per second, by increasing to 750 gave, well, maybe a bit less than we were achieving just by spraying on the cursor, so the, the T6P precursors. 
So it's equivalent to giving them a 50% increase in light availability, that yield effect that we saw. So I've talked about that yield effect. I now want to talk about, <coughs> just coming to the end of the talk in the last five minutes or so, this uh, growth recovery effect that we'd previously seen in growing um, seedlings in cold conditions. So if you grow seedlings in the cold, or any plant in the cold, then if you transfer it back to the warm, there's usually a growth spurt. So, and we hypothesized maybe that T6P was in, could be involved in this growth spurt after transfer from, from cold to warm conditions. And so this is the kind of growth stimulation that you get when you transfer from cold to warm. In genetically modified Arabidopsis with much less T6P, then you, you don't see this, this growth stimulation when you transfer from cold to warm. And this is work that was done by Katia Nunes, who actually s who was from Portugal, but she spent two years of her PhD at uh, Rothamsted. And one of the joys of doing science is the, the big international connections that you make. Science really is a, an international language. It's one of the things that I've found uh, particularly, I've particularly liked about science. And so the hypothesis was that T6P primes gene expression for rapid growth from stress. And in this case, it was cold stress. Now, would the same thing happen in the recovery from drought stress? So Cara did the experiment. So these are wheat plants that were droughted for nine days. They were then applied with this chemical and then rewatered, and, and uh, she found that there was, a, there was indeed a growth stimulation <coughs> in response to spraying with the chemical. So T6P appears to be priming gene expression in anticipation of growing again, so whether from low temperature or from drought. And so the combination of the yield effect and the resilience effect, we were able to get this paper into nature. It's effectively 10 years' work. And uh, we had a, a year's worth of revisions from one of the reviewers. And um, yeah, we had 19 pages of re reviewers' comments from one of the reviewers. I won't tell you some of the things he said about the work. But anyway, we got it published. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the challenges. You just have to keep going in science. And the rewards are very great when you do. Cara won um, this award <coughs> for her work. And we received all this. Um, coverage in the, in the press. So I'm not sure that we maybe have solved food insecurity, but we think it's, we're now at the stage where we want to collaborate with a big company to actually use this as a treatment. But we also think it's a way of actually understanding more about fundamental science, maybe discovering genes for yield as well. So we can use these chemicals, which provide us a, with a way of actually tracking changes in T6P, following the treatment with it. So the advantages of this method are that there, are, there is one method for different crops. So it gives you that flexibility. You don't need to be developing different gene promoter constructs. Flexibility of application. We've got potential for uh, dramatic effects on yield through giving a, a big pulse of T6P, <coughs> shifting physiological boundaries. Maybe it's a faster route to market. It's non-GMO, publicly acceptable. And then it can be stacked with other, with other chemical applications, fungicides. And so in the last couple of minutes, so that just to summarize <coughs> where we are with this research. So 20 years ago, this was the understanding of the trailer's pathway functioning in resurrection plants. And the first transgenics were made actually to try and engineer plants for stress tolerance, to try and take trahalos and it was found that the, and, and use it as a stress protectant, but it was found that the transgenics that, that were produced didn't accumulate trahalos, but it was subsequently found that they did have differential levels of T6P. And it appeared that from looking at the plants, that these were quite robust, healthy plants, a number of transgenic plants have been modified from metabolism were particularly sick looking or didn't have any phenotype at all, but these were quite different. These, it was as if the trailer's pathway was engaging in some way with uh, a regulatory system. And so, you know, it's taken us 20 years to, to work out some of the details of this. 
So these transgenic plants were produced in the late 90s, telling us that something interesting was going on with this pathway. And then a few years later, well in 2011, around the publication of the, the genome sequence, um, it was then established that there were all these genes for the, for the pathway in plants that hadn't really been understood before. Uh, an embryo-lethal mutant was then published that showed that the TPS1 gene was absolutely essential for in plants for the first time. It was shown that uh, T6P was indispensable for carbohydrate use. Then it was confirmed that T6P was acting as a sucrose signal. We showed at Rothamsted that protein kinase can explain, we think, a lot of the effects of T6P in plants by regulating uh, reg uh, metabolic pathways as a feast famine signal, performing um, metabolic reprogramming in effect in response to feast or famine. And then it was shown, so it's not just um, something that's occurring in Arabidopsis, which it was shown that uh, T6P is important in, in wheat. I mentioned that T6P uh, priming role in, in response to low temperature. The rice work was published recently and then there have been these examples that I've told you about in crops. And so potentially this system then, not just these, these traits of grain number, grain size and end product synthesis, but also appears to be an effect on flowering. So sucrose through T6P tells a plant that, uh, or T6P tells a plant there's sucrose available that it's okay to flower, that you've got enough carbon to do that. So it's one of those, it's part of the, the regulation of flowering. It's also, we think, involved in biotic interactions. Interestingly, other organisms produce trahalos, fungi in particular produce har uh, large amounts of trahalos. And there could be this kind of warfare between the, the fungus and the plant in, in uh, the fungus tries to take over the host's signaling machinery to actually hijack sugars. So I've told you then how the sourcing system is particularly important in crops, that um, to improve crop yields and resilience, we need to be modifying it. We need to be understanding fundamental processes of sucrose utilization and signaling. Through modifying this, we've been able to improve yields in, in three major crops. Three approaches so far have been able to do this. And I think a strategy to combine with this um, low T6P in the phloem would be to combine this with high T6P in the endosperm. So, and this is something that we'd like to do. We'd like to, so by decreasing T6P in the phloem and increasing it in the, we might get then increased grain number and increased grain size in the same plant. And that would be an interesting experiment to try. And then just recently, natural variation in a TPP gene has been found to associate with grain weight in wheat by this Chinese group. And so I'd like to acknowledge people that have been involved in the work. Carl's in the audience, she did the wheat experiments. We've had an excellent collaboration with Ben Davis and we wouldn't have been able to do the chemical work without that. We wouldn't have been able to do those, that GM work in maize without Syngenta. And then we've had BBSRC funding. We're currently collaborating with CIMIT in Mexico. That's been a really great collaboration. I haven't mentioned that at all today. And yeah, I do feel immensely fortunate to have been involved in this work. And please do keep in touch and visit if you want. We've got great facilities for doing research on crops. I mentioned about the long-term experiments that go back to 1843, but we've also got very modern facilities as well. So we can do loads of techniques, modern, modern uh, biology, biochemistry, molecular biology, as well as growing really healthy maize plants in our growth facilities. Thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.